There we go. Oh, dear. So welcome all. Um, the whole idea of this conversation is that as far as we possibly can, we can imagine that we're sitting in a very comfortable shared lounge room having a chat and uh, we would be having some kind of glass of wine or soft drink or cup of tea um, and just relaxing. So there are no PowerPoint presentations that we expect to give. Uh, there's very little formality. Um, it's just a conversation. Now, I would like to introduce Ruth. Um, often people don't like to introduce themselves and then Ruth can add whatever richness I um, neglect to mention. And then we've got a series of questions that I'll just um, ask. And if you would like to suggest questions, please do so in the chat and we'll just see how the conversation goes. We might pause at different times um, and just check that it's going in a direction that you're all enjoying. And then I can encourage you again to um, ask questions. So unless there's any kind of question about how this thing works, I'll just um, kick off. No, there's nothing hurtling at me via chat. So um, I have never actually met Ruth in, in kind of the real world. So that's interesting, isn't it? We live in a funny, we live in a funny world now. But I, I first encountered Ruth because she um, very early on expressed interest in the OR mentoring program. I think from memory before we'd even finished designing it. Uh, and I thought, oh, I like that. I like someone who's keen to mentor other women. Um, so we've now had a couple of conversations to get the hang of each other. Um, Ruth's professional background is as a child psychotherapist. She has a master's degree from Monash University and she was the head of the Department of Child Psychotherapy at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Um, she has almost 40 years experience in disaster and emergency recovery, starting from Ash Wednesday, I think, to the present time, both in Australia and internationally. She's a founding member of the Australasian Society for Traumatic, Traumatic Stress Studies. Excuse me while I just admit some more people. Um, and also the Australian Child and Adolescent Trauma, Grief and Loss Network. We did discover when we were meeting and chatting that actually she um, knows very well the woman who supervised my PhD. So there was a fun little moment of serendipity there. She is the recipient of something fabulous called the Pied Piper Scholarship which I just thought was marvellous, in 1991 to study what was then an emerging field of child trauma across the US. She's lectured at the previous Australian Emergency Management Institute at Mount Macedon, for those of us who remember that. Um, and she's advised as a consultant and an advisor to DHHS, Emergency Management Victoria, the Red Cross and many others. Um, she specialised in the treatment of families and children who've been damaged as a result of a whole range of experiences leading to trauma. She's the recipient of an Order of Australia Medal for her services to community health. Um, and an interesting little note, and then I'll stop, is that in the 1990s, Ruth and another colleague attempted to establish something called WEMA, Women in Emergency Management Australia. How cool is that? So ahead of her time is how I interpret that. So Ruth, have I missed anything that you'd really like people to know about who you are? I think that's a nice umbrella. Thanks, Margaret. Yes, yes. Thank you. My pleasure. So um, perhaps I could get you to share with us how your interest in trauma and emergencies actually began. What led you to join this kind of work? Well, the, uh, Margaret, the stepping off was Ash Wednesday, as you mentioned, but at that time at the Children's Hospital in my clinical role as a child psychotherapist, I was working in the unit within the Children's Hospital where uh, we had um, little children from infants through to sort of puberty age who had really severe emotional distress of one kind or another, really, really interfering with their development and of huge concern, <clears throat> excuse me, concern to their families. And 
um, in working with those kids, I began to realize that there were underpinnings to their current um, functioning uh, that included really um, what we could calmly call untoward events, challenging events, um, sometimes really horrific events. I remember one little boy in the unit who was um, really a frightened, terrified little fellow of about eight years old, who spent all his time on a sort of a skateboard type um, arrangement with little wheels, and he wouldn't let his feet touch the ground. This little boy um, was one of the boat children from Vietnam. This is in the early 80s. And gradually we realized that he had come from an area where there were landmines and he had it totally embedded in him that it was absolutely unsafe to have your feet on the ground. And he was, of course, terrified. You could imagine he'd lived in that environment. He'd come as a boat child to Australia. And this fear was absolutely Im embedded and immovable within him. So at that stage in pre-Ash Wednesday, um, I was really turning into these, these children um, who'd had a range, one or a range of, of experiences that had diverted their development. And simultaneously, I was working part-time at that stage, I had my own kids, and I was working in, uh, as a volunteer in a community organisation for children of families who at that stage were very poor. And it would be interesting um, as a group of women to understand at that stage, um, there was, a, barely a single mother's pension. Um, mm. There was a limited widow's pension support. It was the widow's might really still operating. So for mothers who, for whatever reason, were the sole parent and sole provider for their children, there was absolutely minimal support. And so I was working with an organisation that was supporting uh, the mothers and the children to um, try and deal with some of these external pressures on their functioning. And I, through that, I became very aware of the huge range of stresses that these mothers and these children were experiencing. And that for some of them, uh, again, for those children, it was impacting on their development and for some of them diverting it onto less um, maturing pathways. So when Ash Wednesday happened, and again, it's another interesting piece, at that stage, we did not have emergency management plans. Um, there was not the unit within DHHS that we have in Victoria now. There was nothing um, and it's a formal structure to deal with recovery. And also um, there was very little knowledge about children. Uh, at that stage, uh, the DSM, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, had only in its recent, most recent edition identified PTSD, but it was for adults. Children weren't even, even mentioned. There was no conceptual framework for a children's response to trauma. So, when Ash Wednesday happened, DHS, as it was called then, um, had the glimmering of an idea that the, the children who'd been impacted in Victoria by those massive fires would need some support, that they had had uh, an overwhelming and very challenging experience. And we were asked at the Children's Hospital to um, go up to the Macedon area, which we were designated to, to see what was needed and, you know, maybe you need to provide something for the next six weeks, you know, maybe the next six months. And I thought, six mm -hmm. months? Yeah. yeah. That may be a good time frame for some children and families, but there will be some kids and some families because of their experiences and external events where this is by no means going to be all settled within six months. Mm. Anyway, I went up and um, did the so-called, I was asked to go up, Ruth, could you go up because you, you, you're working with kids who aren't doing too well and you know how some of these community systems work. So could you go up into the community and do it, it? <laughs> so off I paddled with a couple of colleagues and 
um, we went into a meeting room, um, as you know, you, those of you who've worked in disasters would know where all the different community groups come together. And they, they were really trying to work out what the issues were, what services need to be provided, who needed to be provide them, where the funding was coming from. And um, I immediately honed in, of course, to the children's issues and then said, look, I think we need to be talking with the child maternal health, the preschool teachers, um, school teachers, and get an understanding of what's actually happening for these children um, as much as the staff can know what's actually happening for um, the teachers and the child maternal health nurses. And also, what's the impact on the staff? Because most of the staff were either you know, residents within that community or very, very closely attached to that community. So going into the various um, kindergartens and child maternal health nurse, it became clear uh, from what I was hearing wearing my clinical hat that there were some children and families who were really struggling. Others who with some guidance and support and some knowledge would um, take that on board and it would help them to harness their own resources to move forward. So I came back and with a colleague, a social work colleague, I said, we need to apply for some funding. This is more than six months. So we sat down um, in my living room floor, put in a submission, would you believe for $50,000, my word, we were modest, um, for two years on a, a basis of um, going up two days a week and you know, within the initial phase. And lo and behold, we got got our fifty thousand dollars which yeah. I thought was a huge amount of money and we developed this consultation service. So um, I developed a model with a colleague and about community engagement but I also came home now this is another interesting little stat and went to the library at the children's hospital and said look we're stepping off into something that nobody here in Australia has really experienced working with children in a community event and um, can you, you know, could you please find out what's going on overseas? So the librarian, in those days, we didn't have Google search. We didn't have all these wonderful digital search agencies now, but she got through something called Medline and another thing called Cyclit, which was the very beginning of um, sort of digital exploration of resources. And she came up and looking for children, disasters, trauma, she came up with six articles. Yeah. Uh, six articles. Now I suppose there's 60,000 articles if you um, did a search yeah. with that framework. How long, how long ago is this, Ruth? We're talking... 83. 83. So we've yeah. for 40 years. Yeah. Um, and at that stage too, um, thinking of the broader community issues, there was barely a recognition of child abuse, mm. barely any recognition of um, sexual abuse of children barely any rec recognition of the impact of domestic violence on children and family structures. It was, by comparison with where we're at now, it really was the dark ages. But um, those six articles sort of confirmed the, the hunch that I'd had from theoretical knowledge and the clinical experience in the hospital to have enough confidence to sort of gently go forward. So that's, that's where it began. Um, mm. yeah. And um, there are so many interesting things about, about that introduction. Uh, so much has changed. Oh, yeah. And um, for those of our network who are um, younger, you, you may not remember all of that. I remember all of I remember a world without computers at all. Yeah. Oh, how about that? No oh, computer. Our and first computer was a little screen like this and you sat with your mouth. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm really interested to explore some of what's changed over the last mm. you know, 30 to 40 years. And so I'd be interested in your reflections, not only about what's changed in terms of issues in the sector, like the emergence of children actually being an area of study in relation to trauma generally and in emergencies, but also I'm interested in any reflections you have on what it's like to be a woman in either the workforce generally or in this sector. So, so we'll, we'll try and tackle some of those in order. Um, 
Okay. Any well, general reflections of that? We have been doing a bit of this offline, everyone, I have to say. So <laughs> any general reflections about maybe some of your roles and what's changed in a work? Oh, well, I think employment conditions is a really, really um, significant change. Um, when I first started my professional career and until the 80s, um, women were paid only two thirds of the salary of the fellows who are doing the same job working beside you. Mm. So on the basis of gender, not on the basis of the work you did and your productivity, we were paid only two thirds. And when I came back into the workforce uh, in the 70s after having my children, um, I worked part time. And as a part timer, I was not eligible for superannuation. So that has been a huge change as well. Um, the broad culture, of not only in the health and emergency sectors, but within the community, was a, an underlying assumption that all all leadership, no, men lead, men were the managers, the directors, the leaders, the whatever. Yeah. And I found in those early days in uh, my disaster community disaster work that um, I'd perhaps be talking with. Uh, an emergent SES or CFA or police um, and they they would talk to me about children whom they'd come across or families that they were working with um, and they'd ask me questions but if I was with a male colleague if, if I gave an answer they'd sit and listen but they would look to the male colleague for affirmation that what I was saying was actually correct and it, fortunately, my male colleague, once we realised this was what was going on, he referred back to me that, um, uh, well, look, you know, Ruth has said this and I absolutely confer and uh, confirm it. And uh, I think, you know, she's probably got a lot more to tell you. But um, there was... If only we could say that never happens anymore, ever. Uh, look, I think that attitude is so ingrained into the DNA of not only individuals but systems as well and the power of sort of systems culture on individuals um it's very much an interactional dynamic mm. um that it will take take time to work through but from where i sit now um all these decades later i can see there has been a huge change mm. a huge change um and I guess I would say, say to, you, to you women, all of whom are in a much younger cohort, to be clear about um, the goals that you are aiming for, um, make sure you have your information and your knowledge base, and um, when you're communicating, to present it in a way that, that in, uh, as much as you can, <laughs> to engage, try to engage. Um, people um so you're talking about issues rather than um and it's just so hard to do but not get carried away on the gender um issue there was one committee that i was on which was a sort of a medical health committee years ago and it was pretty much all male it well apart from one other woman there would have been let me think 25 30 people men on this committee and myself and another woman, and I tell you, we had to sit and listen to these wretched, sexist jaw jokes and stories. It was absolutely appalling. And there was, in that stage and age, there was no way you could call it out like you actually can now. Mm. You, because if I tried to call it out, they would never have listened to um, the message, the contribution, the opinions, the questions that I had to ask. Mm. I would have immediately been put in a, some sort of box and the lid jammed shut and that would have been the end of what I would have been, I could contribute to the, the big picture. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So um, I think some of that is changing. I certainly hope. Oh, yes. yes. I certainly hope most of us have experience of that changing to some degree. Oh, I find yeah. very much now, Margaret. I'm on a committee at the moment with um, a lot of fellows and there's none of that. Absolutely yeah. none of that. And I must say, the younger blokes coming through have a very different, at least within the you know, professional groups I'm in, have a very different attitude from, you know, three, four decades ago. 
Yeah. A um, couple of questions are starting to come in now. So I want to ask one of mine first and then go to them. For anyone who's joined uh, after the sort of um, modus operandi for this session, feel free to add a question into the chat um, and I will have a look at them and we'll start, I'll start asking them of Ruth. But I just wanted to ask one more before we go to that. In some of the projects you've been involved in over the years, um, I'm interested in any, well, this is kind of a rude question really, in any favourite projects or any projects that um, you think transformed the way emergencies are looked at or understood uh, or anything you think is just um, something you want to share because it's so different to what we do now. Are there any projects that stand out? Oh, well, look, I think, and it's one that's still going on, but, it, and I mentioned it right at the beginning when I started to talk, is the uh, developing the concept of community recovery. Mm. Um, and uh, I think that was one of my major, some of you may have heard of a colleague, Rob Gordon. Now, he and I together developed th this, um, this model. Um, and I, I have here somewhere or another, a paper that we published way back in about 85, um, talking about um, community recovery, um, the phases, the issues, things to look out for. Mm -hmm. And it's been most gratifying to see how that has actually evolved over the decades, where it's just accepted now. But yeah. at that stage, there wasn't the concept, let alone um, an understanding within the various uh, organisations involved in disasters, the community recovery um, was um, a particular piece of work that um, had to be understood and that had to be worked with and there were multiple issues and complexities. Whereas now, um, you know, when we have a disaster, nobody, it, it's just part of the, the framework. Yeah. Um, to think of communities. And I would, I think the evolving, um, being part of evolving that and then embedding it within DHS way back in the, I uh, suppose it'd be the eighties and nineties, Victoria was actually leading um, Australia on this um, concept of community recovery. And we lectured up at um, the Emerging Management Institute and gave to all the, various recovery courses up there and slowly it's now become part of Australia and I also introduced it into the States after one of the big earthquakes and carried that model through into Indonesia after the tsunami in um, 2004 so I worked backwards and forwards from there for about four or five years um, up in Aceh um, under the umbrella of their lead university who was who that who was initiating the local recovery. So oh. I think that's probably been the most important. The second one, which is my passion, of course, is, is the children and where they are within the, the journey of um, impact and recovery from a disaster. Oh. And I must show you while we, we stop, <laughs> I did show Margaret earlier. These are some of the, the uh, I'll try and put it up, some of the very early, I think of the glossy leaflets now and, and things that come out in digital line. But this is one of the very early Red Cross ones that came out in the 80s. Um, <laughs> look at this, you, you couldn't believe it. This was put out by um, a community group from um, <laughs> things we prepared. It's all been done out in the Gestetner uh, issue. So, and of course, now we have the lovely glossy um, productions. And I think you've got the links to some of those Red Cross ones. Did I send them to you, Margaret? Yes, you did. Yes, yes. And so, it's interesting, people would be familiar with Emerging Minds as well, and it's all getting more and more and more beautiful and yes. um, multi-format, you know? So it's fun to see the original versions. Oh, I tell you. <laughs> and this was one of the, the, the first sort of beautifully glossy papered one this and this goes this sort of thing um and that was put out by a community group in gippsland after the big floods down there in the early 90s so um we wrote up the the content and and they so this was one of the really first ones for um for children at a community level but the information hasn't really changed terribly much it's the formatting and the um yeah. the way it's communicated has changed yeah. yeah look one of the questions i'd like to ask you ruth um 
kind of flows from that. So Sandra is asking, Ruth, do you think that current disaster response in Australia is addressing the needs of women and children in the way that international development disaster response is applied? Um, now, I'm not quite sure that I'm understanding. Yes, it's interesting. So it mentioned, Sandra, would you like to speak to your question? If you unmute, you may be able to have a bit of a conversation. Oh, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so my question really is about um, the cluster approach and quite quite specific um, approaches to areas of response in relation to so looking at the UN system, mm -hmm. we're looking at all of all of the needs of people, and then we come to protection, and then we look at protection, and we then go then we then go okay, we've got gender based violence, and we also have child protection, mm -hmm. um, and and also in part of that. Um, that cluster is the security, which is your police that are protectors of a range of different things. And I remember having conversations with um, Save the Children quite a long time ago about, about how come we're not actually doing child protection in emergencies in Australia. Uh, and, and, um, and that went, that conversation used to go on and on and on and on and on. And so my question really relates to that because my disaster response experience is I live in Newcastle and I work for DOCS, which well and as child protection manager for and worker for 17 years. So I've got a bit of a history like you in terms of child protection and protection in general. And um, I'm just writing another note. In 1989, um, Tony Singler, the psychologist, wrote a short paper on helping children understand the, the, the earthquake and, and the, the, mm -hmm. the disruption. But that was very early as well. So now I'm, I'm actually now the civil protection policy advisor in, in East Timor, but I was evacuated. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting here at home. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and we, over there, we're actually, you know, trying to, to I guess, um, strengthen the, the capacity of other, um, uh, other societies and cultures um, to actually look after their women and children in disasters. Um, mm -hmm. So that's where my question comes from. And do you think we do it in a similar way? We have standards for protection. We have standards in globally, there are child protection standards, there are all sorts of standards in relation to, and really we try and work on those. They're all rights-based, human rights-based, and, and um, so on and so forth. So we don't, I don't hear human rights being mentioned in conversations in Australia. Mm -hmm. Within the Overt, overtly, they're covertly they're there, but yeah. So, and I think the thing that just as women working in this industry, we still uh, the the expectations around us are that we will have a deep, deep um, body of knowledge where we can actually, because we're women, we can be the or the carer and and the lover and the you know so on and so forth. And not everyone has that experience or that professional, um, I guess, the competencies or the experience to put all that stuff into place, as well as be the firefighter, as well as be everything else that's expected yeah. of all the, the young women and the women that work in Australia doing this work. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's my, so, and I, of course I taught TAFE as well for a long time and trauma-informed care is a really important thing for us to learn for ourselves that um, we need to really learn how to look after ourselves um, and learn how to be able to listen to others without taking on board. And that's another area of expertise, well, not expertise, but just a competency. Mm -hmm. Women in disasters in Australia, we need to share that with people as well so that there's mm -hmm. not a traumatised cohort of women who are fighting fires and trying to be everything at once. Mm -hmm. 
is. I think that's coming, it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking coming coming back to thinking of the the international scene and the local scene, and um, you're you're spot on when you mention that there are the international standards, the rights of the child, uh, etc. And I well, there's think, standards for child protection in emergencies. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So you and know that's. To, hold and this relates back to um, a little sort of point I think I made earlier that if you are operating from if you've got your standards clearly in your mind and then the the challenge and the skill is then applying those standards absolutely yes. into the situation of and yeah. that then brings uh, you know as our focus today as women bringing those um, into effect uh, in environments that where they may not a recognize those standards the culture might work against those standards <laughs> may right. not be listened yeah. to um, and yes, that's true as well yes and there may not be the the uh, resources to um, enact those standards so this is where it becomes really complex because well, yeah, multiple yeah. dynamics operating at the same time but I think if you are very clear um, that you are operating from um, clearly articulated standards that have a, a universal base i.e the um, rights of the child um, then the school comes in in, in acting, interpreting and, and acting those standards within the particular social context that you're involved in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah this, I'm not new, I'm not a new um, person in Timor. I was there for three, I lived and worked there for three years wow. um, and was there in 2006 when there was armed conflict and mass um, IDP. Um, yeah, and that of, went on for years yeah. ago it was um up at Pakapanya when we had the um safe havens operating for the east timorese evacuation after the un compound and also when the kosovo people evacuated were here for three months 99 yeah. after 99 yeah. yeah so i guess part of that sorry all i was going to say is then if you've got a traumatized and just reflecting on what you've already said that if you've got a traumatized um community or a society, which was the case with Timor, um, because of all of, the, all of the traumatic events that all generations have experienced, and there isn't a generation that hasn't experienced multiple trauma, trauma, and then you've then got all sorts of different responses from community, um, when another, another we've, we've just had another in the last seven, nine months, a forest fire that took out 600 odd houses, a flash flood that's taken out half of Dili and also another another smaller flood. And so these, these occurrences impact and impact and impact and you end up with a traumatised society. Mm. And so you need to be really careful mm. as a worker. Um, and mm. Yes, yeah. So I'm aware we've got lots of questions flowing in now. Thanks. Yeah, Thank I'll you. stop now. Um, I might get you to re-mute when you've finished and if everyone can sure. stay on mute when they're not actually having a conversation with Ruth. Uh, flowing on from some of that actually, there's another question here from Kat and I'll skip the intro Kat, but the question at the bottom is, do you ever wonder about the long-term impact uh, and recovery of children that you've worked with way back when? Mm. And what, skill do you, what skills do you use to let go? Now, if I understand that question correctly, Kath, it's, it's about how do you leave it behind and keep going yourself? Um, and I think that's something we all face because if we carry everything with us, we can't, we can't. cope anymore. Okay. Well, I'll answer the, your, the first part of your question first <clears throat> about the, the children I've worked with. Um, and, and one of the, the challenges and the letting go is that so most of the time you don't know what has happened to an individual child mm -hmm. as they grow up into adulthood. Um, occasionally, um, just through sort of networks and professional life, um, I have had feedback, which has been great feedback. Um, recently, I was talking to a group of teachers around COVID and one of the teachers came up to me afterwards and said, oh, do you remember Da, 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 da. 
um, my son, he's, he's absolutely gorgeous now. He's a young man, he's 29. And then I heard after another siege event where a kid was, um, his life was threatened and got a bit of feedback, but it's only informally. And that's one of the challenges because in doing the work, you, you do, you pour your heart and your soul and enormous amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. But um, long-term, um, you've just got to accept you don't get the feedback. Um, now, um, the second part of the question, how, how do you let go? And uh, I could answer that in different ways. I think when I was a very, very young, brand new graduate, I was working in a uh, psych, uh, mental health facility and heavens above, I, look, I was only 21 and um, came from a very sort of protected background. And it was a rapid learning curve for me about the struggles um, of, in people's lives and the experiences they'd had. And this is long before self-care was even thought of, let alone introduced into any trainings, let alone in, um, in your workplace where there was any supervision or caring. And I can remember thinking, oh my word, how am I going to deal with this? Um, I, I've, I've got to let it go. So I trained myself as um, I walked out through, it was a beautiful hospital in lovely grounds. And as I walked out through the gate to catch the train to go home, I made myself say, okay, I'm leaving that behind. I'm now going home. And I found, um, somehow that pattern became embedded in me and in subsequent years when i was um uh had a car to drive home i was so appreciative that my journey took about 20 minutes so that i could put the radio on i could listen to some nice music or whatever whatever and i used that as a transition space and when i got home i left it behind and what I've done now when I'm basically retired and don't have an office space is that I have my study here, which is an absolute mess. But when I've finished working, uh, I make sure I still knock off at the end of the day, um, you know, seven o'clock or something, half past six or whatever. And I leave the study. I don't go back into it. Come, don't come back into this room until the end of the day. I'm lucky enough to have that particular space. And... Um, and I make sure that I'm doing other, you know, nice things um, and the self-care. And within that, I think it's important to talk about self-care because working in disasters and emergencies, um, I found that most people are really committed to it and want to be there that, um, as you develop expertise and knowledge and contacts and your skill base um, continues to evolve you have an enormous amount to give back and to be able to harness that experience and that skill to hand on to slowly improve um, situations as waves of more events come on you really you really must look after yourselves um, not only for your own health and for your families and your nearest and dearest but thinking with your professional hat on that you actually are then able to contribute um, back professionally. And so as much as we can, we avoid this awful cycle that does still happen of reinventing the wheel every time a new disaster or a new incident happens. I think that's one of the downsides for me um, at this stage in my career is seeing how frequently the wheel is reinvented and how much energy goes into that, how many resources are poured into reinventing the wheel, rather than taking hold and of the learnings that exist and stepping off from that point at a much higher point up the ladder of service provision. Yeah. So yes, I think all, and I don't need to talk to you about self-care because I'm sure you're, you're all well embedded into um, not only in oh, I think we might all need a reminder sometimes I think oh, um, yes yeah at the risk of speaking for anyone else I'll say certainly I find that because of what you're describing we're committed to what we're doing and we care so deeply I think our boundary management can do with little reminders from time to time yes look look work out your boundaries and it might seem um, in the short term that, oh, if I just sat up tonight and I, if I did this and I did that, I'd get it all done, it'd be much better tomorrow. 
Um, but the cumulative buildup of that um, slowly starts to eat away. Um, I'm thinking it's a bit like fairy floss. It's, <laughs> it's uh, when you put some fairy, have some fairy floss and it slowly dissolves and all of a sudden you're left with nothing. Mm. Um, so it really, it really is important um, for your better performance the next day and to sleep on it and to also recuperate and also for your long-term contribution to the field. So many important things in that, Ruth. I'm hoping, Kath, that uh, back at the beginning of that, your question got answered. So, yeah, thumbs up. Great. Um, so there's another question. I'm noticing, uh, and many of you, you can all have a read of the chat if you'd like, uh, because there's comments happening throughout the chat, Ruth, and I'm taking pleasure in the comments that um, refer to hearing about you through Beverly Raphael, who was, in fact, my supervisor. And there's a few of us doing a lovely remembering of Beverly and the contribution she also made, which is really nice. I have a question, though, from Chris, which I'd like to ask because I'm interested as well in the answer. Um, in terms of community recovery, so you've touched on it a few times, do you have some best practice tips on how we include the voices, the actual voices of children, as opposed to adults who speak on their behalf? Mm. And now include them for what purpose? What, what, what is it so that the child feels heard or that the child is actually framing their journey? Or... Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, says Chris, yes. Both. Both of those. Both of those, okay. And okay. I would say also, based on, on um, some anecdotal experience of children who do get to speak, so they get that sense of him empowerment such a trendy word but that yeah. sense of i was actually part of this which yeah. i think is a wonderful thing as well yes 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 so and and i think uh, the reason i re wanted to refine that because also um some people are saying that children should be framing the policy that then directs their recovery now, if it's uh, that, it, that it becomes very complex. Um, I think it, when you think of a child, children until they're <laughs> sometimes through adolescence are still very egocentric, even you know how egocentric adolescents are. So um, it's important for all young people and for all of us indeed to feel that no matter what happens in our life, that there is somebody or some people who really are deeply interested in us, who really are, are connected so that the person doesn't feel, the child doesn't feel alone in this experience mm. and who is there to be with the child in their experience and to stay with them through the ups and downs of their recovery. Now, to be with a child in the ups and downs of their recovery means listening to them, to what their needs are, what their worries are, how, what their confusions are. Do they need um, time, someone just to listen to them? Do they need some more information? Mm. Are they confused because they've got so, many in, so much information coming in uh, that they, they, they don't know what is what, so they shut down? So giving a voice to the child <clears throat> and the young, adole young adolescent means um, joining with the child where they're at and then travelling their journey with them. So if the child actually is feeling alone, try to understand how and why and um, what, that's, what is that about from the child's point of view? Because a child may feel alone and we could say, but look, you know, you've got a nice family and mum and dad love you and you've got plenty of friends. That's our external appraisal, but that's not what the child's experiencing. So it's important to listen to the child and then try to, in connecting with the child, understand what it is they need. And then depending on their age and their age, their sense of agency they have, 
to help them actually find their pathway to meet those needs. Now, some children will need more support, others will, um, with minimal support, be able to meet it. Um, one of the, um, and I'm still thinking this through myself, about children forming policy when in fact they themselves are still immature and egocentric and don't understand the big picture of, of the um, ramifications of what it is they might be wanting to happen um, makes it very complex because you could have a class of 25 children, it doesn't matter whether they're six or they're 16, they'll all be seeing it from their own perspective and their own knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And there is no way you're going to be able to provide sort of policy and practice to meet the needs of those 25, let alone all the multiple groups of 25 children that exist in our society. So um, that, becomes, that becomes quite complex. And um, children may say, well, look, we need more, oh, I can't think off the top of my head, we need to have more say in um, the activities that are provided for us. But one has to be very careful if they're in a, in a decision-making forum that is going to take on board what that young person says, you have to be very careful um, that other groups of children with other needs and wishes are not going to be alienated because um, uh, they're not being represented. It's a very delicate issue. And I think if, again, coming back to, as we we're talking with Sandra, coming back to your core principles, it's important that the children um, have somebody who really connects, connects with them and um, travels the journey with them to meet their, to understand what's happening for them, what their needs are, and then to help them to find their way to meet their needs. Mm. Now, I'm aware that Amanda, I, I think that's you having your hand up, Amanda, to ask the next question. But just before I go to Amanda, Chris, does that cover what you were seeking in asking that question? Are you happy enough with that? Yeah. Are you sure? Because I, I know I went off on a tangent again, back to principles. <laughs> yeah, well, it, I think Margaret put her finger on it for me, which is the, um, the sense of agency of children and young people mm. in having a voice in terms of what recovery looks like to them. Mm. So it often seems to me that adults speak on their behalf. Yes. Um, and the adults who do so may or may not have any idea of what the issues are for the young people or the children and, and um, yeah. what, what path they're looking for for recovery. So um, yeah. certainly I think it's possible to develop some kind of consensus amongst groups of different ages and so forth about where they see where they'd like an input into the recovery pathway and I was just wondering if you had any ideas about that but I think I'm aware of some work um, Bryony Towers is doing which is really exciting and the, the more we all learn about the work she's doing the mm. um, happier I'll be because uh, yeah. she's that very thin. Yes 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 and um, the speaker Margaret? Sorry? Future speaker yeah, it could be, it could be future yeah, speaker. That would be good, yes, yes. I think the important thing is, and you, you also focused on that, Chris, is, is listening to the child and where they're at and where they, where, how is it they're going to get their sense of agency? What is going to give them their sense of agency? Um, and to be mindful that the, what is a sense of agency for one child or one group won't be for another because they're all in a, a very dynamic developmental stage and what works one week or one month or one term um, could well be different in, in the next uh, six months or so because they've undergone a, quite a, a um, dynamic developmental change. Yes, so we have to be fluid in the framing of the space um, for, those, for that cohort of kids, yeah. Now I'm aware we could um, we could talk for hours. We only have a few minutes left, but Amanda has been very patient. So Amanda, do you want to throw a question to Ruth? Yes, and I worry that it's not a two minute question, but here goes. Hello, Hi. Ruth. Um, I'm currently working up in northeast Victoria, um, and we are um, 
very proudly trialling this um, real, real community-led approach to recovery. And I'm picking up on the point you made before regarding um, learning and leveraging off um, what we've learned from the past and bringing it forward. What I'm really challenged with at the moment is how we are community-led and listen to the voice of the community and I'd be led by the community at the same time with years and years and years and years of experience that we want to bring into the process. I'm finding it challenging to bring the two together. Um, sitting on the sidelines, having giving you know the community with its voice and um, talking about all the things that the community wants and needs, which is fantastic. But the little voice in my head is going, I know stuff, I know stuff, I know stuff, but how is that community led? So have you got any tips about how to bring those two together? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um... Okay, um, it's a process of working with them, uh, with the groups. Um, now, I don't know whether it's your local community recovery group or different, different groups, be it um, Rotary or school or whatever. But um, we've, actually, we've actually employed locals to work in the recovery process. So they are local people that are employed by a council as the recovery mm -hmm. officers with no recovery experience, but it's their, okay. their, the community. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's time consuming, but it, pay, it pays dividends is sitting with these different groups and people and um, what I have found in the past, um, the group will bring up an issue and they're struggling with it. And it's, again, as we're talking with Chris with children, it's joining the group um, where they're at with their struggle. And then when they come up with something, you can say, well, look, we, we could think about it this way, not, not, not that, well, in the past or at so-and-so they did X, Y, and Z, but, um, handing it back to them we can think about it this way um, and then you can say now there as I see it you know there are a number of options here there's this option and that option and the other option um, so if we think those through in terms of long-term consequences and resources um, and actually be part of a thinking part of the group but presenting it as questions and options rather than, um, well, we've done it this way, and, you know, and you wouldn't, Amanda, I can see from <laughs> the way you, you work, but um, it's, um, it's, it's a quasi-education collegiate, um, it's a, multiple, a role with multiple roles within it, of being a co-worker, um, collegiate, um, training and information giving, um, uh, as you go, and at times you've you've got to bear the some decisions going not the way that you think it might be. But um, it's important. I think the, the important to hold the group together because um, one of the things, and you're probably experiencing this up now up there, uh, is the splits that start to emerge in in communities. Um, once the immediate crisis and is over and recovery starts to settle down, <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, an important, important role, even if, if the, you can't dot all the R's and cross all the T's, but an important goal, and this is working again from your principles, is to hold the community together as much as you can because they're going to be together and their descendants are going to be together um, you know, for generations to come. And it's amazing how, when these schisms occur, how they can become embedded and then handed down um, generation by generation. Mm. I don't know. Right. Right. We can talk about this for hours, actually, but um, that's my shorthand version. Yeah. Um, that's another thing. <laughs> don't session. worry, Ruth. Ruth, I've got your phone number. I'll give you a call. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Look, everybody, according to my computer, it's one minute past six. So let's try to keep as close to time as we can. Um, I think there are a couple of uh, topics that emerge out of that whole conversation for potential future conversations. So it occurs to me to invite you to send me ideas for future conversations <clears throat> in terms of either speakers or topics. 
Um, and we at the committee level will have a chat and see what we can organise. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I've thoroughly enjoyed the chat along the side. So even though I've not read everybody's comments aloud, thank you for having a conversation along the side as well and sending a few links. Um, as I say, we've recorded this session and we'll try to make it available as quickly as we can. And um, I just want to say thank you, Ruth. It's been an absolute pleasure and we're getting comments from the side thanking you for your time as oh, well. It's been lovely. Delightful. Thank you. This is one of the things I love about this work is actually being with people like yourselves. That's, you know, that's one of the things that's kept me going all these decades is um, it's just a joy. And some of my dearest friends are people I worked with way back decades ago. We, we're just at this stage, we're bosom buddies. It's, um, it's been, yeah, yeah one of the, the joys of, of the work. Yeah. Yeah. Very good people work in this sector, I find. Oh, fantastic. And this is what I wanted hey, to join. Margaret, I'm on, my, I'm, I'm on my phone and I'm missing the... Margaret, sorry, I'm on my phone and I'm missing all of the chat stuff. Is there any chance you can take a copy of the chat conversation and, and share it? I'd love to see what people are talking about. No worries. I will click the thing that says take a file note of the chat and do my best. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. And I hope to see you next month. And uh, thanks for tuning Lovely in. Lovely to see you all. I've enjoyed it. It's been wonderful. Have, Bye, a, right. have a relaxing evening and forget about disasters and trauma. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye.